So we were talking about Taylor series. <coughs> okay, so then there are several Taylor series that you should just memorize. Okay, these are ones that you should commit to memory. <coughs> okay, so then the sine of x, I think we did that one. Didn't we generate that one, I think? So that will be the sum from n is 0 to infinity. Now, someone tell me the general features of sine before I write down the, the series. Right, it has alternating terms. Okay, good. The terms are alternating. Okay, what else? <coughs> what else? You only have odd powers, right? Odd powers. Because, you know, one of the ways you can remember that is that sine has an odd symmetry about the origin. So it's uh, Taylor series expansion about the origin will have the sum of only odd uh, terms. So then, like this 2n plus 1 factorial x to the 2n plus 1. Wonderful. Okay, so that's sign. You should commit this to memory. Okay, so then just so it's clear, right, what I'm what this is talking about is this is x minus x cubed over three factorial plus x to the fifth over five factorial. There's a Java update, good. <laughs> minus x to the seven over seven factorial plus etc. <coughs> Okay, cosine. Tell me about cosine. Oops. So again, an infinite sum. Again, the terms are alternating. Now tell me about the symmetry of cosine. It has even symmetry about the origin. Okay, and that should help you remember that all of the terms of cosine will be even. Okay, so then 2n factorial x to the 2n. Okay, so what is meant by this is that this is 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial minus x to the 6 over 6 factorial plus etc. <coughs> Okay, so now here's an interesting one, one that we, we didn't do, but you should do in your own time just to verify. You know, sine has the odd terms, and cosine has the even terms. Is there anything that has all of those terms? What? Tangent would be a good idea, but no, not tangent. How about... We already saw it once. I've already written it down for you once. E to the x. Right. E to the x. Except the terms are not alternating. So e to the x is the sum from n is 0 to infinity of 1 over n factorial x to the n, right, which most people would write like the sum from n is 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. So I only wrote it like this in the first way so that you see the analogy to sine and cosine. Okay, so the exponential actually gets all of the terms. So what this is, okay, this is understood to mean 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial plus all the way. <coughs> That's interesting. So the exponential gets all of it. Okay, so now I want to show you something. Okay, so these are, these are the three that you should really just go ahead and memorize. Really, probably one more would be worth your time. Two more. Let's write them down. Okay, so log of <coughs> x 
this can be written as, so we already did this one once upon a time. I think we did it last time, actually. x minus 1, okay, and then minus x minus 1 squared over 2, and then plus x minus 1 cubed over 3, and then minus x minus 1 to the fourth over 4, plus etc. <coughs> Okay, so then generally, <coughs> generally you can write this as, this is the sum. Okay, and this one's kind of weird because we're going to need to start it at 1. The sum from n is 1 to infinity. <coughs> okay, so then if we start at 1, we need to have x minus 1 to some power. So what power? To the n, right? Because the first term is to the first power, <coughs> the second term is to the second power, etc. And so then now this is x to the one, x minus one to the one divided by one, x minus one to the two divided by two, blah blah blah. So I need to be dividing this by what? N. And now that you can see the terms are alternating. The terms are alternating. So I need an alternator. So negative one to what power? N minus one or n plus one doesn't matter. Okay, wonderful. So there's the log function. Okay, <coughs> there's the log function. Now I'd like to point something out that's interesting. Okay, that's not really something we're going to get into deeply in this class, but it's just interesting. So notice for sine and for cosine and for the exponential, right, that we have this factorial in the denominator, right? Factorial factorial, factorial. Okay, that factorial in the denominator grows much, much, much faster than x to the n grows. Okay, x to the n is geometric in x, whereas, whereas this is factorial. So what that means is that where, where are sine and cosine going to converge? And the exponential. Everywhere, right? They're going to converge everywhere for any value of x. You can plug in any value of x that you want. Now, how about this? Look at log. Does log have this factorial happening? No, no, it doesn't, right? So then, this is, this, where will this converge? <coughs> Not everywhere, <laughs> right? Not everywhere. So then, wh specifically, where it's going to converge, if I am remembering correctly, it will converge from 0 to 2, not including 0, including 2, right? You, it doesn't go any further than that. Because this, right, this, if you ignore the denominator for just a minute, Okay, x minus 1 to the n, that's geometric. That's geometric. So if x minus 1 gets too big, okay, then it will be start behaving like a divergent geometric series. Whereas this, right, like this one, for example, no matter how big x gets, it's dominated by this factorial. Right, so it will work for anything. Okay, good. So then the last power series that you should commit to memory is the arctangent function. arctangent function, and it is the following. <coughs> so, it is the sum from n is, let's see, where do we need to start it? We'll start it at 0 <coughs> to infinity. Okay, so the power will be x to the 2n plus 1. So what does that tell you about the powers? They're all all odd. And why does that make sense? Someone tell me a geometric reason why it should make sense why all the powers of x in the arctangent expansion are odd. Because arctangent is, it has an odd symmetry about the origin, right? What does arctangent look like? Do you remember? Right, arctangent looks like this. So it has an odd symmetry about the origin. So isn't it satisfying that its power series expansion about the origin contains only odd terms? Yeah, that should be intellectually satisfying to you. Or it, I'll say this, it's intellectually satisfying to me. <laughs> okay. <coughs> okay, so then now, we will need to divide by the same power, so divided by 2n plus 1. 
Okay, and then the terms need to alternate, so negative 1 to the n. Wonderful. Okay, so any question about these? <coughs> okay, so now I'd like to point something out that is not really part of the class and won't be tested over, but it's important for you to see it, I think, if you're going to go on in math or physics, and it'll only take about two minutes. So then let's have just a brief remembrance of this. So I'm talking about this thing. I squared is negative 1. So what, I'm ta what am I talking about here? The imaginary unit, uh, complex unit. Okay, so then, so let's remember. So <coughs> there's I is I and then I squared. Well, that's negative 1. And then I cubed, that's what? What's I cubed? Negative I, <laughs> right? And then I to the fourth, what's that? One. Okay, so then for those of you that are linguistic, that's probably fine. Okay, but for someone like me, ge geometric, you know, what does this mean? So this is I. Oops. This is I here. Okay, multiplication by i constitutes a rotation by pi over 2, so this is i squared. Right, this is i. This is i squared. Another rotation by pi over 2, this is i cubed. One more rotation right here, this is 1, so i to the fourth. Okay, so then that's what multiplication by i does. It's, it's geometric action is... Rot is, is uh, rotation by 90 degrees. Okay, so now let's do something that's kind of weird. Let's consider the following expression. e to the ix. e to the ix. <coughs> okay, so according to the power series expansion for the exponential function, assuming that it's legitimate for us to we're just going to blanketly assume it's legitimate for me to start using this complex number. Okay, it will be the sum from 0 to infinity of ix to the n over n factorial. ix to the n over n factorial. <coughs> okay. So then, by that, it is meant that, you know, you'll get something like this. The sum from n is 0 to infinity of i to the n, x to the n, over n factorial. So now, let's try and imagine what's going to happen here. Right, so on the one hand, you have this x to the n over n factorial, and that kind of behaves like, like the exponential of e to the x. Then on the other hand, you have this i to the n, Right, you keep raising i to successive powers, and you're going to you're going to rotate through this succession. Right, you're going to get an i, and then a negative one, and then a negative i, and then a positive one, and then an i. Blah 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 blah. Okay, so let's try and let's try and see what happens if we do this. <coughs> okay, so the first term we get when we use i is zero, right? Uh, n is zero. That is, that'll be i to the 0, which is 1, x to the 0, which is 1, in uh, 0 to factorial, which is 1. So this will be 1. <coughs> okay, 1. And then, when n is 1, we will get i times x over 1 factorial, which is plus ix. Okay, plus ix. Okay, now what, what's the next term we will get? So now it will be i squared. Right, i squared, because that's n is 2. What's i squared? Negative. Negative 1. So it will be minus x squared over 2 factorial. Okay, now we have i cubed. Right, i cubed is negative i. So now it will be minus i x cubed over 3 factorial. Minus i x cubed over 3 factorial. So the next term is n is 4 n is 4, so i to the 4th is what? One. 1. Okay, so then we will get plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial. 
Okay, now we have i to the fifth, i to the fifth, which is just i. So then now it'll be plus i x to the five over five factorial. Hmm. I hope a pattern is starting to emerge in your in your head here. So then now the next term will be minus x to the six <coughs> over six factorial. Okay, and then it will be minus i x to the 7 over 7 factorial. Okay, and then plus some other terms. Okay, so then now, tell me, what's happening here? What's true about all of the even terms? What's absent with all of the even terms? i, right? The zero term, no i. Square term, no i. 4, no i. No i. The 8 term will have no i. What's true about all the odd terms? They all have i. So then let's factor, let's factor this and say that, okay, well, this is, this is 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial minus x to the 6 over 6 factorial plus dot, dot, dot. So those are the even terms. Those are the even terms. So now the odd terms, they all have an i in them. So I'm going to say that this is plus i. Okay, I'm factoring out the i. And now all of the odd terms are x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial minus x to the 7 over 7 factorial plus dot, dot, dot. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Just a minute, right? What is this? You know what this is. You should recognize this. Cosine. This is cosine, right? And what is this thing inside of this being multiplied by i? This is sine. So wait a second. So what we're saying is this, is that this is the cosine of x plus i times the sine of x. e to the i x is this. That is fantastic, right? That is seriously fantastic, okay? So then now, <coughs> what this is telling you is that the exponential function, there's a really deep connection, right, between the exponential function and the trigonometric functions. To a mathematician, really, the, the trigonometric functions are just a special case of the exponential function. That's all that they are, right? So then e to the ix, the real part of that is cosine. The imaginary part of it is sine. Okay, so then most of the time when you're going, when you have, not most, but much of the time when you're dealing with trigonometric functions in advanced mathematics, you're not dealing with them at all. You're actually dealing with the exponential and you deal with it in this way. Okay, so then finally, now, now that we have this formula, okay, I'd like to ask you to evaluate the following. e to the i multiplied by pi. What if I happen to plug in x is pi, is my question. So that, that would be the cosine of pi plus i times the sine of pi. Okay, so the cosine of pi is what? Negative 1. Okay, so that's a pi. Okay, so negative 1, and then what is the sine of pi? 0. So look at this equation. I'm going to rearrange this just slightly. I'm going to move the 1 to the other side e to the i pi plus 1 is equal to 0. This is almost unbelievable. Right? Look at it. Have a look. The five, five of the most, you know, probably the most important mathematical constants that are, that exist, right? The exponential, the complex unit, pi, 1 and 0, all related by this one equation. That is unbelievable. This is called Euler's identity. Okay, <coughs> after a Swiss guy named Euler, okay, I understand that you think that his name is may, may be pronounced Euler, but it's not because he's a Swiss guy. Okay, and E U, right, is pronounced Oi. There. Euler. <coughs> okay, just like uh, you know, in German Europe is pronounced Europa not Europa. Wonderful. Euler. So any question about this? Isn't this fantastic? The exponential and the trigonometric functions are actually deeply connected. I find that very stimulating.
Okay, so any questions <coughs> before we start reviewing? Okay, so then I have one question for you. I have one question for you. Okay, I could say find find a power series for e to the x uh, squared. Now let's say x cubed. E to the x cubed. This should take you like two minutes at most, maybe one minute. It'd take you 20 seconds if you know if you know exactly what you're doing. <coughs> okay, so you need to use two facts. The two facts that you need to use are these. First fact is that the Taylor series, the Maclaurin series for the exponential function is x to the n over n factorial, right? That was written two pages ago. Okay, the second fact that you need to use is two, if you have a function f of x represented as power series like so. Then it is a fact that f of x cubed really to any n whatsoever, right? It could be x to the 4, x to the half, whatever. What is this? What will the new power series be? It'll be a n x to the 3 n which is x cubed to the n. So that's wonderful. So using these two facts together, okay, you should be able to write a conclusion for e to the x cubed <coughs> power series. So what is it? So what will it be? Yes, x to the 3n over n factorial. Okay, wonderful. So, you can see that this is not a complicated question, right? So some of the times when I say find a power series, that means create a table, do all of this work, blah, 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 blah. Sometimes, right, there's a, you know, if you just use the list of power series that you know, like exponential, sine, cosine, arctangent, log, if you just use those, then you can come up with answers like this quickly. So now I can follow this up with something like the following. I can say, okay, fine. <coughs> so, so that's part one, right, part A. And then now part B, I can say, I want you to compute the antiderivative of e to the x cubed. So how would you do this Right, without the context of we're in the power series section. How would you go about doing this? A u sub? But what would you what would you substitute? Hmm. Integration by parts. Could you do it by integration by parts? I'm not sure you could. Yeah, you might be able to do it with like three or four iterations of integration by parts, and it would it would start getting unwieldy. I think I'm not sh I'm not sure how if it would work out at all. Maybe, but but ah, we have a power series for e to the x cubed. Right. So then we can just integrate this power series. So let's do that. <coughs> So, this will be the summation from n is 0 to infinity <coughs> of the antiderivative of each one of the individual terms. Let me comp compute the antiderivative of each one of them. Okay, so then now, <coughs> the antiderivative is, with, is 
anti-differentiation with respect to which symbol? X, right? So you need to be very careful, right, that you're paying attention to which symbol is the variable. Okay, good. So this will be the sum. Wait, I'm going to write this over here. Sum from n is 0 to infinity. So this 1 over n factorial, that's just a constant, right? So I'm just going to write it right there. Then now, what is the antiderivative of x to the 3n? x to the 3n plus 1, right? Is it 3n plus 3? Is it 3 times n plus 1? Or is it 3n plus 1? 3n plus 1, right? Good. Okay, and then divided by 3n plus 1. Okay, now I see here. What do I mean by that C there? The constant of anti-differentiation. So how do we figure out what C is? How, how do we figure out what C is? Oh, wait, we can't figure out what C is. <laughs> we can't figure out what C is. <coughs> Never mind. Okay, good. So any question about this one? Okay, so then a typical thing, <coughs> typical kind of thing is I'll do something like this. I'll give you some function where it would just be totally unreasonable, right? I'll make it more unreasonable than this one maybe, right? You could not comfortably compute the antiderivative of this. But with just a little bit of reasoning, you could write a power series for it, and then you could compute the antiderivative of its power series, no problem. Okay, wonderful. So any question about this? <coughs> Okay, good. So, are there any questions about any of this before we go backwards in time? Yes? Right. So, then, when should you go through the thing? And the answer is, uh, if I say, you know, I could give you a question like this. Uh, this, uh, I could say, yeah, something like this. Find the Taylor series for cosine about <coughs> zero, showing all steps. Right? right? And that, that means that you don't just say, I've memorized that the Taylor series is this. Right? That's not enough. That, that's where you'd have to say, okay, I'm going to compute all of the derivatives, etc. So does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, I'll be very clear if I want you to, to do that. Right? The majority of the, of the manipulations I'll want you to do with Taylor series will be, you know, you you've memorized four or five Taylor series and then you do things like this with them. Okay, <coughs> but some I may want you to compute a Taylor series from the beginning. Okay, other questions before we go back in time? Okay, great. So let's do an example. Please compute for me the integral from 0 to 1 of 4 over the square root of x dx. And you must do this properly. Okay, so I'm going to write a very short answer which is wrong. Okay, so you could do this like in just a couple steps and say that, well, this is 0 to 1, and then 4x to the negative half dx, and then this will be 4x to the 1 half divided by 1 half evaluated from 0 to 1, multiplication a, this is 8, square root x from 0 to 1, which is 8. Wrong. Right, on, uh, on one hand, but you have what's written on the page is the incorrect procedure. Okay, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this? Right, so then there's something going on here, right? This is the integral from 0 to 1. What is this function doing at 0? It has an asymptote there. You can't just integrate up to an asymptote. Such an integral has what kind of name? What kind of thing do we do we give it? It's improper, right? It's improper. Okay, so if you were to give me some kind of answer like this, I'd probably give you two out of ten points. 
Okay, two out of ten points because you failed to identify that this integral is improper and you failed to treat it properly. Okay, so then in order to deal with this, the problem that's occurring is at zero. So what we're going to do geometrically, <coughs> right, the function looks like so. something like this. We want that whole area. So what we're going to do is we're going to integrate integrate from x is b to x is 1 and then we're going to do what with b? Um, make it go to 0 from the from the right, right? You can't approach from the left. That would not be legitimate. You approach from the right. Okay, so then what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, we can compute this area as a function of b. Right, so then this will be f of b. <coughs> okay, so then f of b is the integral from b to 1 of 4x to the 1 half, uh, negative 1 half, dx. Okay, so that's a, that is a proper integral. Okay, assuming that, you know, uh, 0 is less than b is less than 1. <coughs> okay, so then this will be 8 square root x from b to 1, which is 8 times 1 minus the square root of b. Okay, as a function of b. So now we're going to compute the limit as b goes, not to infinity, b goes to 0 from the right of f of b, and this is the limit as b goes to 0 from the right of 8, 1 minus square root b, which is obviously equal to 8. Okay, so any question about this example? The limit what? Do you mean, do you need to copy this into here? Yeah. No. So if, if you write this expression in terms of b, I just copy this into here. <coughs> okay, an improper integral. Okay, so then, you know, one w <laughs> the most catastrophic way that this occurs, okay, is something like this. I'll give you an integral, so the question is over. So I could say, you know, something like, okay, let's compute the integral from, you know, uh, negative negative 10 to 10 of 1 over x plus 2 dx. Okay, and if you just do this uncarefully, you just you're just totally. So wh why is this integral improper, by the way? <laughs> yeah, at negative 2, there's an asymptote. At negative 2, there's an asymptote. So if you don't handle that asymptote properly, then you will determine that the answer is zero, <laughs> which is absurd. This integral diverges quickly. <coughs> okay? So any question about, mm, no, it won't be zero. It'll be, no, it won't be zero. It'll be, it'll be something, but it, it won't be right. <laughs> okay, because the answer is that this integral diverges. Okay, so any questions before we move to the next thing? So that's basically 8.8. .8. Yes, so for this one, you would need to say, you would need to do something like this, that this is the integral, the sum of two integrals, from negative, two, uh, negative 10 to negative 2, 1 over x plus 2 dx. This one is improper. And then plus the integral from negative 2 to 10 of 1 over x plus 2 dx. This one is also improper. So both of these are improper. Okay, so then you, in order for, when you break an integral, into the sum of other integrals where you know you have asymptotes at the limit points right all of these integrals must converge all of them must converge okay if even one of them diverges the whole thing diverges so at least you know if you take what i say as true i say that this diverges what must be true about one of these one of them must diverge in fact both of them are going to diverge on this example okay good other questions <coughs> yes 
for this one, yeah, for this one you'd have to approach from the left. For this one you'd have to approach from the right. The reason being is that the picture looks something like this. So if this is if this is uh, x is negative x is negative two, then on the left side it will be negative, so it will look like this. On the right side it will be positive, so it will look like this. So the area that's being talked about, right, is this is this whole thing, right, all of this area going up to infinity, all of this area going up to infinity. Okay, and it's between negative 10 and positive 10. <coughs> so, you know, both of these areas, right, this area right here, there's infinite area in this part, there's infinite area in this part. And they don't cancel each other out. Okay, good. Okay, <coughs> so then the next thing that we were talking about in time after this was a sequence. So someone remind me what a sequence is. A list of numbers. How many numbers? Infinitely many numbers. Right. So then specifically a sequence, a sequence is a function from the integers, well, from from this set. So what do they call it in this book? The natural numbers. To the reals. Okay, so then they are less general than the objects you're accustomed to, right? You can only plug in integers like one, two, three, uh, a million. You can't plug in pi. Can't do that. Pi is not an integer. Okay, so then... <coughs> You know, typically the w the way they're denoted right, is this kind of thing, A, the sequence A. So the subscript N is the variable, the symbol. Okay, so then AN is 1 over N. Right, there's an example of a sequence. Okay, so now in retrospect, in retrospect, you know, you can see that the, uh, historically the next thing that we were going to deal with, the next thing we were going to deal with is series. Now this is called the harmonic sequence. Okay. This is a list of numbers. Does the harmonic sequence converge? Yes. What does it converge to? Zero. Right. The harmonic sequence converges to zero. Does the harmonic series converge? No. No, it diverges. It's a P series with P is one. Okay, so it diverges. It behaves like the log function. It goes to infinity. Okay, so on the one hand, the sequence converges. On the other, the series diverges. Okay, so someone explained to me, if a sequence is a list of infinitely many numbers, what's a series? The series of a sequence is the attempt, the attempt to sum them all together. Right? Has to be an attempt because it's not necessary that it's going to succeed, right? That was the whole. That's the whole thing that we've been talking about all this time, this, this last third of the semester, is that if you try and add infinitely many things together, you you might succeed, and you you actually probably won't, <laughs> but you might, right? Okay, and we've been going over various ways to detect when you will succeed. Okay, that's the, that's what all those tests are. Blah blah blah. Okay, good. So then, important properties about sequ about sequences. Okay, so what are important properties about sequences? And there's two things. I'm fishing for two adjectives. Monotone's one of them. Good. Okay, so then a n is monotone increasing. if a n plus 1 is greater than or equal to a n. Okay, for those of you that are going to go on in math, right, this is called non-decreasing in other contexts. Non-decreasing. <laughs> non-decreasing. I feel like a lawyer saying that. <coughs> okay. 
Monotone increasing. <coughs> so you can't say increasing because it might be equal, right? So then it's not increasing, it's just non-decreasing. Great. Okay, so then instead of monotone increasing, right, you can imagine what's going to happen if I say monotone decreasing. Monotone decreasing means that an plus 1 is less than or equal to an, and in some cases that will be called non-increasing. <laughs> feel like double talk. Okay. <coughs> One, two. So what's another adjective that's very important about sequences, especially when it's paired with monotonicity? What was it? Bounded, right? Bounded. Okay, so an is bounded above. If an is less than or equal to m, for some m and for all n. Okay, so bounded above. So now let's take these two examples. What if you have a monotone increasing sequence that is bounded above? What must be true? Converge. Must converge. Do you know what it converges to? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay, but but you do know you do know a little bit, right? So then, if a if a sequence is monotone increasing and it is bounded above, then it converges, and then for those of you that are going to go on and map, it converges to its least upper bound. Okay, so then that is to say that well, if m is an upper bound, then so is m plus one, and so is m plus pi, and so is m plus your favorite number, your favorite positive number. It's an upper bound. Okay, so there's infinitely many upper bounds. And there's lots of them. So the question is, is, is there a smallest upper bound? And the answer is yes. Right? The reason why there is is it's complicated, and we're not going to get into it. But yes, there is a least upper bound. Okay, so monotone increasing sequences, which uh, are bounded above, converge to their least. They converge, and they converge to their least upper bound. Okay, so do you remember all these things? Okay, wonderful. Okay, <coughs> so then how do you tell... How do you tell if a sequence, tell me some ways you can show that a sequence is monotone increasing. Right, you could use inequalities, right, if you're just good with using inequalities, you could use inequalities. Okay, alternatively, you could uh, say, okay, let's, let's do one for example. <coughs> Okay, so how about an? An is <coughs> n cubed plus 4n plus 8. Okay, n cubed plus 4n plus 8. I want to show that this is monotone increasing. Show it's monotone increasing. Okay, so someone was saying something about calculus and blah, 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 so walk me through it. The derivative of what? Ah, but you can't compute the derivative of a sub n, right? A sub n is a function only defined on integers. Ah, right? You have to, you have to say, well, I'm going to consider this corresponding, this corresponding smooth function, f of x, is x cubed plus 4x. Uh, not 4, yeah, plus 4x plus 8. Okay, so this function is smooth, right? So I can compute the derivative of this one. Okay, so the derivative is 3x squared plus uh, 4. <coughs> 3x squared plus 4. Okay, so then now, notice, notice that what is the smallest that 3x squared can ever be? zero, right? <laughs> I, if you're allowed to use any x's whatsoever, then the smallest it can ever be is zero. And what is the smallest four can ever be? Four, four right? Good. So then the smallest that the derivative can ever be is four. So the derivative is positive. Okay, so this is telling you, this is telling you that f of x is increasing for all values of x. Okay, and this is telling you, therefore, that an is monotone increasing. 
Great. <clears throat> okay. So then now, how about this same sequence? Okay, so this is part A. Part B, is it, uh, is it bounded above? Is it bounded above? Okay, no, it's not bounded above. Right, not bounded above. Not bounded above because the limit as n goes to infinity of n cubed plus 4n plus 8, well, what is that? That's infinite, right? It gets arbitrarily large. Okay, so then how about part C? Is it bounded below? So is it? Is it bounded below? Huh? It, it is bounded below, right? <laughs> because, because think about it. What is the smallest value of n that you're allowed to plug in? One. Right? One. You can't plug in any smaller value. So then this sequence is increasing. And there is a smallest value you're allowed to plug in. So that means that a1 is the smallest term in the sequence. So it's bounded below. So yes, it's bounded below. Yes, by a1 is equal to what? 1 plus 4 is 5 plus blah, 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 is 13. Okay, so it's bounded below by 13. So now I have a question for you. We showed that the sequence is monotone increasing and bounded below. So what can we conclude? What can we conclude? It should be resounding. Nothing. We can conclude nothing. <laughs> right? We can conclude nothing. What am I trying to get you to say? Right? So we showed it's monotone increasing and bounded below. What does that mean? That means nothing. What if it was monotone increasing and bounded above? Then it would converge. Okay? Good. So any questions about this sequence? So I should be able to ask you, I should be able to give you sequences and you and I'll say, is it monotone? And then you check. Is it bounded? You check. Can you make any conclusions about its, con about its convergence? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, you should be able to go through that kind of question. Okay, remember that, you know, one thing to remember is that sequences, uh, if you can make the corresponding continuous function, then you can treat, you can treat it like a continuous function. So, for example, <coughs> You know, I could give you something like this. A n is, uh, how about n to the 2 over 2 to the n? Right. Great. Does it converge? Okay, so who knows, right? You should be able to tell, right? So then the numerator behaves like, behaves like a polynomial of order 2, whereas the denominator behaves like a geometric object. So which one's going to grow quicker? the denominator by a lot, right? <laughs> because, for example, if you plug in 10 in the numerator, what do you get? 100. If you plug in 10 in the denominator, you get 1,024, right? If you plug in, if you plug in 32 in the numerator, you get, I don't know, like 9,000 something something or whatever. <coughs> if you plug in 32 in the denominator, you get over 4 billion, right? So then, the geometric part grows quite, quite quickly. So then you could compute the limit as follows. You could say, well, I'm not exactly sure what that thing does, but I can consider this corresponding continuous and differentiable function, 2 to the x, like this. And then I could compute the limit as x goes to infinity of this thing, x squared over 2 to the x, like this. And now you can see, oh, well, this uh, this function is currently in the indeterminate form infinity over infinity, so this is a sick limit. And I need to take it to the hospital. All right. Lovely. Okay, so then the limit as uh, x goes to infinity, infinity of 2x over, now who remembers the derivative of 2 to the x? 
yes, 2 to the x log of 2. So this is still indeterminate, so now what? Let's take it to the hospital again, right? Back, back to the emergency room with you. Okay, so then this is 2 over 2 to the x log 2 log 2. Okay, now the numerator is a constant, the denominator goes to zero, or goes to infinity, so the whole thing goes to zero. Fantastic. So any question about this one? So this is a reminder that all of the calculus one stuff is fair game. Oh, is it about to crash? No, it's gonna it's gonna keep living good. Okay, <coughs> wonderful. <coughs> so then after this we talked about sequences for a for a time. What was the first kind of thing that we talked about for series? Geometric series. Right, geometric series. Okay, <coughs> so then specifically, we have this. Okay, so then the sum from n is 0 to infinity of a r to the n, a multiplied by r to the n, is a geometric series. is a geometric series. Okay, the sequence part, okay, just the sequence part, okay, that's called a geometric sequence. Okay, so then what is the defining characteristic which makes a sequence a sequence geometric? The ratio of successive terms is a constant. Okay, the ratio of successive terms is a constant. Okay, so notice that a n, which is a multiplied by r to the n, has the following property. a to the n plus 1 over a to the, uh, a, a n plus 1 over a n is r, right, a constant. So that's what's important about geometric series, a geometric sequence. So then now, we're able to show, right, using the sequence of partial sums, using the sequence of partial sums, I was able to show you exactly when the geometric series converges, and not only that, but when it converges, exactly what it converges to. Okay, so this converges when what? Yes, converges when, <coughs> converges when 0 is less than, the absolute value of r is less than 1. <coughs> okay, so you sort of have to have this requirement Right, you can't let the ratio be zero because if the ratio is zero, then then the ratio of successive terms is not defined. Okay, so it converges exactly when when you have this property, and so then better than that, not only do we know when it converges, but we know exactly what it converges to. So it converges to what? A over one minus r. Right, a over one minus r. Okay, so I had a nice joke, probably, about a bartender and a math conference, I hope. So it's probably on YouTube. Maybe have a look. Okay, so for example, the sum from n is 0 to infinity of something like this. So how about mm, 2 to the 3, uh, no, 2 to the 4n minus 2, say, over 3 to the 2n plus 1. And then I'll put a 7 here. Okay, so my claim to you is that this is geometric. Okay, and on a first inspection, right, it sort of looks like a geometric series with ratio 2 thirds. Okay, so I wrote it so it kind of looks like a geometric series with ratio 2 thirds. Would, would such a series converge? A geometric series with ratio two thirds. Oh yeah, that would converge. But let's see what happens here, right? So if you do this, uh, you know, algebraic circus hula hoop thing, okay, then you can rewrite the numerator as two to the four to the n multiplied by two to the negative two. Right, so I factored the numerator in that way, and then the denominator can be factored as 3 to the 2 to the n multiplied by 3 to the 1. 
Okay, so just doing all kinds of <coughs> arithmetic things here. So 0 to infinity. Now, this is division by 3, multiplication by 2 to the negative 2, so that's division by 4, so this is division by 12, so 7 twelfths. Okay, multiplied by, now this is 2 to the 4 to the n, and this is 3 to the 2 to the n, so they can be factored into a common form like this. 2 to the 4 is 16, 3 to the 2 is 9, all to the n. So this is still a geometric series. Okay, it's a geometric series. What is a? 7 twelfths. What is r? 16 over 9. Does this converge? No, it diverges. Because 16 over 9 is greater than 1. So now, so this diverges. Because r is 16 over 9 is greater than 1. So now I'd like to point something out, just in the hopes that in case you... So the question would be finished now. But now I'd like to show you what would happen. What if you just tried to use the formula a over 1 minus r with this? Okay, you would get 7 twelfths over 1 minus 16 over 9. Okay, now, 16 over 9, that's greater than 1. So 1 minus 16 over 9, that's something negative. The numerator is positive, so this ratio is negative. Okay, every semester, every semester, okay, I give a geometric question. And some student tries to tell me that the sum of all of these positive terms, right, positive, positive, they're all positive is negative. Okay, every time it happens. Okay, it doesn't even make sense. If I could give, if I was willing to give negative points for this response, then I would <laughs> give negative points. Okay, totally missed the point. Okay, the sum of infinitely many positive terms might converge, but it is not going to be negative. Wrapped all the way back around to the negative side, I guess. I don't know. Okay, so any question about this one? <coughs> <laughs> I don't know, right? You've got to think about it, right? Don't just blindly apply formulas. If you just blindly ap apply formulas, then it's not going to work. Okay, <coughs> so I'm just going through things. This, is there anything anyone wants to see? Please stop me and let me know if, it, if we get there. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep yakking. Where are we? Oh, we're in chapter 9. That's why I can't find it. <laughs> I, was, I was already flipped to chapter 14. <coughs> okay, so then that was like section 9.2. Okay, so then the next thing that we had was from section 9.3. Yes? Uh, that's probably not going to be on the final exam because it wasn't covered okay. much by me or the other instructor. Okay, so then there is the integral test. Okay, so then if you have a series like this, the sum from n is 1 to infinity of a n. Okay, so then if you have a function f of x such that 1, f of x is continuous. F of x is decreasing. 3. F of x is positive. So a continuous and decreasing positive function. And 4. A n is f of n. So that is to say that I give you a series I give you a series, and from this series you can extract a function which is continuous and decreasing and positive, and the sequence and the function agree at every integer value, then these two things, the sum from n is 1 to infinity of a n, and the integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx, what's true about them? What's, how are these two things related? Yes, they both converge or both or both diverge. Ok, 
Okay, so this is called the integral test. Okay, so the way it goes is as, is as follows. I'll give you a series and I say use the integral test. <laughs> okay, so that's a very good indication that you should use the integral test. Okay, continuous decreasing positive and agrees with the sequence. So generally speaking, you kind of want to avoid using the integral test, honestly, because if you use the integral test, okay, you need to show that you can use the integral test. You have to show all of these things. You got to show it. If you don't show it, then you haven't demonstrated that you can use the integral test, so you can't use it. Okay, second, even if you successfully show that you can use the integral test, then you have to integrate. Okay, and you have to integrate quite carefully because look, this integral is what? Improper. It's improper. So you have to do an integral. You have to know how to compute that integral and you have to treat it as an improper integral very carefully. Okay, so generally speaking, you want to avoid this kind of thing. Okay, unless, you know, unless I say you have to use it and then then you're stuck. Okay, so an example would be something like this. The sum from n is 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared plus 1. So this is a candidate for the integral test. It's a candidate for the integral test because, right, this is one, you could compare it to this integral like this, and what would this be? What is this integral? Arctangent, right, arctangent. This is arctangent, so then this would be uh, what? Pi over 2. Right, minus pi over 4. So this integral converges to pi over 4. Okay, so then this one, this converges. So then what will be true about this? Also converges. But before you do that, you're going to have to show that this integrand, 1 over x squared plus 1, it's obviously positive, so that's not a big deal. It's obviously continuous, so that's not a big deal. But you're going to have to show that it's decreasing. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, what would be something much more convenient to do with this one? A comparison test, right? A comparison test. Because you could say that, well, uh, you know, 0 is less than 1. Right? That's a fact. So n squared is less than n squared plus 1. So you could take reciprocals and say that 1 over n squared is greater than 1 over n squared plus 1. And both of these are positive. Okay, so here's, here I have two sequences. This is the larger, and this is the smaller, and they're both positive. Does the series of this, of this sequence converge? Yeah. yeah, it obviously converges. It's a p-series. So what must be true about this one? Has to converge also. Okay, so then, <coughs> so you could say, by the direct comparison test, Since the sum from n is 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared converges, because it's a p-series, the sum from, I from n is 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared plus 1 must also converge by comparison. Okay, great. Okay, <coughs> so you could use you could use the integral test but you should only use it when it's sort of like a last resort. Okay, so then you could have used the limit comparison test, okay, and you still would have compared it to what? <coughs> to this one. Okay, you would have compared it to this one. Okay, so any question about these things? Okay, so do you remember what a P-series is and when they converge? I hope. There's not enough time for me to get into it, but you should know that. I'm never going to give you a P-series. I'm never going to say, here's a P-series, does it converge or not? Right? I'm not going to do that. But I'll give you a series, and you need to see, you need to show me whether or not it converges. Okay, so here's such an example. So the sum from 1 to infinity of something nice like negative 1, no, let's make it like this, the cosine of pi n, and then I'll put something like uh, n squared, plus 1 in the numerator, like that. Yeah, that'll be awesome. And then, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to make it awful. So then n to the fourth plus uh, 3n minus, uh, can't be too much, so we'll say minus 1. Okay, so what do you think about this? <laughs> I 
Looks awful, <laughs> right? <laughs> Looks awful. So then now, cosine pi n, what is that? That's negative 1 to the n. Right? That's just a, uh, a criminal way for me to write negative 1 to the n. Okay, great. So then someone tell me how you ought to do this. So, you know, I could rewrite this and say this is the sum from n is 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n, n squared plus 1 in the numerator over n to the fourth plus 3n minus 1. Okay, so this is an alternating series. So what should I use? What should I use? Yes, test for absolute convergence first, right? Okay. Because, right, even if I don't say, sh tell me if this series converges absolutely or blah, 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 right, if you use the alternating series test, if you use the alternating series test, then you have to show that this function, n squared plus 1 over n to the fourth plus 3n minus 1, you have to show that that's decreasing. I'm not sure it actually is. It might be. Okay. It might be. Okay, but look, look, the numerator, if you ignore, if you ignore the alternating term, the numerator behaves like a polynomial of order what? Two. And the denominator behaves like a polynomial of order what? Four. So this, altogether, as n gets really big, it starts behaving like a polynomial, like a, a rational function, one over n squared. That's what it behaves like. Because we're going to test absolute convergence first. Okay, so we can say, okay, the sum from n is 1 to infinity, absolute, negative 1 to the n, n squared plus 1, over n to the fourth plus 3n minus 1. Well, the only effect that that has, <coughs> because all of the terms otherwise are positive, is to get rid of the alternator. So n squared plus 1 over n to the fourth plus 3n minus 1. Okay, so then using that same argument that we just had, right, n squared plus 1 over n to the fourth plus 3n minus 1. Well, this behaves like n squared in the numerator, and it behaves like n to the fourth in the denominator, so this thing behaves like 1 over n squared. Okay, so then we're going to com we're going to compare with the sum from n is 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared. So we're our expectation is that we're going to be able to make a comparison here. So does this one converge? Yes. This one converges. So what's our expectation about this one? Also going to converge. Now here I would say that there's too many terms to use the direct comparison test. Okay, there's too many terms. So what should we use? The limit comparison test. Right, so limit comparison test. So then we'll compute the limit as n goes to infinity of, of a ratio. So which one should it be? Should it be, should it be this one, this one over that one, or that one over that one? Which one? Doesn't matter, right? <laughs> doesn't matter, right? You got to know when is the one. What is the one that does matter? The ratio test. Ratio test matters. This one doesn't matter. Okay. So then one over n <coughs> squared. I'll write that one in the numerator. Over this glorious thing, n squared plus one, <laughs> into the fourth plus three n minus one. Okay. So then the sum from n is. Uh, this, no, not the sum. The limit as n goes to infinity <coughs> of n to the fourth plus 3n minus 1 in the numerator over n to the fourth plus n squared. Okay, using a variety of steps, dot, 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 dot. This is equal to what? 1. Okay, 1. So what's the conclusion of the limit comparison test when you get 1? What's the conclusion? It converges, right? <laughs> What's the conclusion in the ratio test when you get one? No conclusion. <laughs> right? So you need to be able to distinguish these things. Okay, so then what the thing that is necessary about the limit comparison test is that the limit must exist, it must be finite, and it must be positive. 
Okay. One exists and is finite and is positive, so the limit comparison test concludes that they both converge or both diverge. We compared it to a convergent series, so what's true about the given series? It converges, but it more than converges, it converges absolutely. absolutely. Yes? Yes? No conclusion. If you get zero, if you get zero, what that mean what that means is that the two series were not comparable. So, for example, we correctly concluded that the this the given series could be compared to this one. Okay, so we did that correctly. If we made an error somewhere, like if we said I'm going to compare it to one over n to the fourth, well, the given thing does not behave like one over n to the fourth. Okay, so then we would have gotten zero. Yeah, like this is your reasoning, and then compare right this one to the given one. <coughs> okay, so that's it, right? No more meetings. Okay, so please do an evaluation. They're online. Okay, see you on Friday, or eight days from now, Friday. or not. You might not see me if I'm not in that room. Well, there's, it's happening in several rooms, and I go to one of them. That's because your your name's probably at the end of the alphabet. I I go to the the first room. Sorry. Right. It's not comprehensive. Well, I mean, calculus is comprehensive, so. It's comprehensive in that sense. But I'm not going to ask you a question about 